This is the examination of the hidden human condition. You're listening to the Hidden Killers Podcast. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. Psychotherapist and author Siobhan Scott is joining us today. We're going to talk about Brian Koberger and specifically the area that I, I want to focus in on. What exactly is going on with the defense team trying to access the training records of three police officers involved in the investigation uh, of the murders of the university students? What's your take on this, uh, Siobhan? What are they what are they looking for? Well, you know, it sure worked for O.J. And I'm, yeah. I'm sure in a um, case like this, a death penalty case, they're going to do everything they can possibly come up with. So they're putting on a very aggressive defense, which we would expect. And that means attacking the DNA evidence, attacking those who collected the DNA evidence, attacking anybody who did any aspect of the investigation, if they can find that there's anything to attack, probably attacking the genetic genealogy science that was used. Um, but, you know, from what we know at this point, it still looks like a, a pretty strong case against him. So I would be surprised if they come up with anything that really, um, you know, knocks the legs out from under it. Is this a move of... Uh being efficient in, in, in providing a real vigorous defense, or is this more of a move of, of desperation? I think it's it's probably what any of us would want. I mean, it's hard to put ourselves in Koberger's shoes, but mm -hmm. I think if any of us were accused of a crime and we had a defense attorney, we would want to feel like they're doing everything they can possibly do. So it's probably people who are very dedicated to doing their utmost of what they consider their job to be. Sure, sure. The house, uh, there's talk of, of the King Road home uh, being... Uh, torn down. It's it's planned for demolition. That is for sure. Uh, but as of the exact date of demolition, that's still a little bit up in the air as of this uh, recording. What sort of, of value do you think having the house still standing when this eventually does come to trial? Uh, what does that uh, what does that give the prosecution uh, or the defense? Well, the only reason I can understand that there would be an argument to be made for leaving the house up during the trial would be so that the jury could actually go out as they often do and visit the scene and therefore get perhaps a deeper or more fleshed out sense of exactly what we think happened. But I can certainly see for many people having that house there as a reminder is just that's another aspect of the whole trauma, you know, looking at it, there's never going to be a way to erase the memory of what went on there. And so I can see for many people, there would be probably a very healthy eagerness to just have it taken down. That that spot's always going to be marked. Uh, with with sadness, whether there's a house there uh, right. or not. When it comes to things like this, though, and and I know, for example, in the Murdaugh trial, they they brought the jury out to the uh, the barn, the shed that they uh, the, the murders took mm -hmm. place, and I know that was a very emotional moment for many people. Mm -hmm. What what have you seen in something like this, where a, a piece like that is used uh, in the prosecution of of someone in trial? Does it make a stronger case when jurors can can be there, touch, see, smell, feel, be in the atmosphere where this horrible thing took place? Uh, does it does it connect? Uh, I mean, does it do anything to prove that this is the person who did it, I guess? Or does it just make more of an emotional connection and make it that much more real in the minds of the jurors? Right. I, I think you nailed it with the word connect. It really does allow people to feel what happened in a way that perhaps just hearing about it doesn't have the same impact on them. But again, you're right. Do we think that this is going to add anything to the burden of proof mm -hmm. when it comes to who was the perpetrator. Yeah. It's just just why do we show autopsy pictures, you know? I mean, it it hits people in the gut. It makes it very real for them what what happened. And so I I think I can see why prosecutors like to do that, but on the other hand, it's I don't see how it's going to add to the burden of proof. Sure. 
Uh, let's talk about uh, the personality uh, of Koberger a little bit. We've learned that in 2014 there was an arrest uh, for stealing from his own sister. Uh, his mm-hmm. his dad is the one who even told the police uh, about him stealing uh, his sister's cell phone. A lot of times you'd look at this and go, well, this seems kind of like something you'd kind of handle within your family and not necessarily get the police involved. You know, what sibling stole from a sibling, give it back. Don't do that anymore. Uh, but obviously police got involved in, in this this struggle. Uh, what do you make of, of that and, and kind of the dynamics of that family if this is something that he was actively doing in 2014? Right, right. Well, as I understand it, this was about the time when he had been using heroin and mm-hmm. had been to rehab. And so I'm guessing there was a pattern of criminal type behavior going on. You know, often when people are using drugs like that, they steal from family members. And that's one of the hallmarks of somebody really has an addiction when they stoop to stealing from their family members. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really a red flag. So my guess is it's the kind of thing that a therapist would tell a parent to do is if you see that kind of criminality, particularly from a mid to late adolescent, they need law enforcement intervention. You know, they need to know that there are consequences for doing this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so it, it very likely could have been someone um, involved with the Koberger family advised the father to make a police report. And that was part of the, you know, we talk about when people hit bottom, sometimes they change. That's part of the hitting bottom process sometimes is having having an interaction with law enforcement like that. Do do some people never hit bottom? Do some people uh, just, oh, yeah. just keep going and going yeah. and going? Yeah, sometimes there is no bottom until somebody's dead or incarcerated. And even then, it's not enough for them to gain insight and to to, you know, to change. We do know different people have different capacities for change and different people have different bottoms. You know, for many people with a substance abuse problem, one DUI is enough. You know, and the the mm-hmm. consequences of that are so severe, they stop drinking, they sober up, or they change their ways dramatically. And then you'll see people with, you know, half a dozen DUIs, they've lost their license, and they absolutely continue what their pattern is. So it's hard to know. But I'm a big believer, you know, in families where you have substance abuse and that kind of criminal behavior, stealing or other things going on, that, yeah, getting law enforcement involvement can often be a wake up call. And in that way, you're sort of bringing the bottom up. So someone may not have to slide so low in their addiction. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, obviously, this allegedly went much further, you know, down the road. It, it it does provide, it seems, another glimpse into the family dynamics of, of Koberger, his parents, and his sisters, who we've heard a little bit from here and there. Uh, we, we've heard specifically uh, the rumors uh, about uh, at, at Thanksgiving, one of the sisters making the allegation that, hey, you drive the, uh, the white Elantra, you're mm-hmm. coming from that exact same area. How do we know you're not the person? Mm-hmm. And then the family kind of looking a little bit more into it. It makes you wonder if the family, it makes you wonder how long the family kind of had their suspicions that maybe, you know, Brian is not always making the best of choices in his life. Yeah, definitely. And and it sounds like it, even if the parents weren't completely aware, it does sound like perhaps a sister, at least there was a sister that worked in the mental health profession. And I would think she would be noticing some red flags. It also speaks to me of you really had a fairly normal family. Mm -hmm. And so often we think monsters are always created by this horrible, abusive childhood or whatever. And we know that 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 that's often not true, Mm -hmm. that you can get really aberrant people come out of a home where basically they they were well treated. And how to explain that is where we go into the mysteries of the mind and why people veer off track developmentally so much. But there's absolutely nothing that would flag this family as a problematic family or, you know, problematic parents. Everybody said they were lovely people, you Mm -hmm. know, so um, it's going to be something we'll be deconstructing for quite some time. Speaking of mysteries of the mind, I'm curious to get your take on the the many groups out there that are trying to exonerate Koberger, if you will. And again, he's innocent until proven guilty. And I'm all about hearing evidence that exonerates somebody if it exists. 
but sure. there are a, a, a disturbing amount of of people online that they seem to have found some sort of community around this, but not the community of let's prosecute this person for justice. It's let's find a, a way to make this person not do what the allegations are against them with very flimsy to little to no evidence. I, I'm just shocked by the amount of people that are out there that are, are hanging their hat uh, in this area, doubting 60 FBI agents, the Moscow Police Department, Idaho State Police, Pennsylvania authorities, and and going on the narrative that there's some sort of conspiracy to frame Brian Koberger, of all people, just a college student, uh, nothing special really about him, why you'd have all these people trying to conspire against him. Uh, what is that, where we see community build up around something that just, it doesn't seem like a community should be built around it, or, or there's no logical uh, backing to the strength that they think they have? You know, group dynamics on the internet, they take on this incredible life of their own and you find the strangest things, whether it be, you know, young girls who bond over anorexia and start, they call them pro-ana groups mm. online where everybody's advocating, let's, you know, lose as much weight as we can to the point that they're killing themselves. You know, when you have the ability to connect millions and millions of people around the world, online, you get a strange situation where the strangest people find each other. And the more that they share these kind of delusional or odd ideas, you know, you see it with all the different from the flat earthers, the different conspiracy groups, the more they share these ideas, you know, normal people filter out, they, you know, they may look at something like that and go, well, this is weird, and they move on. But you have a certain kind of pathological person who will latch on to it. And then the more that they build this sense of community, they reinforce this alternate reality with each other. And I think we're going to be deconstructing the internet and the way group dynamics have impacted from our political system to the criminal justice system to, you know, people's general mental health, the incel movement. You know, there are have been communities on group for wannabe school shooters, mm -hmm. you know, online. And it's just really a strange dynamic. But, um, you know, he's a nice looking guy. I saw him in court the other day mm -hmm. and I, I was noticing the nice suit he was in. He was very well groomed. And I thought, OK, there are going to be a bunch of needy, sad women writing him letters now. He's a handsome appearing person. Um, a lot of people would identify with the fact that he was bullied as a younger kid when he was chubby, mm -hmm. you know, and so people will find some aspect, you know, whether it was his weight training or um, whatever other kinds of things that they had in common with him or they admired about him. And they create this fantasy about who they imagine him to be. And then they bond online and you get this strange thing going on. You're locked into the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.